All right, welcome to Sunday night. Um, thank you for enduring two nights of show and tell. The show and tell. I hope that uh, this will be a little bit more than show and tell. But as you know, five of us went to Israel a couple weeks ago, and we had an incredible time. And uh, I, I just, I've been left with an impact similar to what Smed described just a moment ago. Um, first thing I want to do is just to ask, by a raise of hands, who has been to Israel? Okay. All right, who would like to go to Israel? Okay. Keep them up one more time. That answers the question. Well, it might feel like show and tell tonight, but hopefully it's a little bit more than that. I've got two uh, purposes, and you'll fit into one of these categories. The first one is that if you love your Bible and you have the opportunity to go to Israel, you should. And tonight, I'm just going to let you know that we have uh, penciled in a trip, from, from a GBC trip to Israel next year. So if you have an interest, and it's something that you'd be excited about, you love your Bible, and you call GBC home, we'd love to bring you to Israel next March. Uh, more details on that to come. But if that is on your radar and that excites you, then that excites us too. I think this will be a new season where we might actually do more than one trip, like a year after a year or every other year or something like that. So uh, if this trip gets overbooked, which I already can tell it will, then uh, worry not and uh, we can come to Israel together another year. So that's exciting. If, if you've never been to Israel and you don't have the means to go to Israel and maybe international travel sounds sketchy, that's cool. That's all right. You're actually in good company. Most of the people that you will enjoy eternity with will never have been to Israel in their life. Uh, I, I want to tell you that even though there's a lot of excitement about our trip to Israel, uh, you need to know that going to the land doesn't add to the efficacy of your Bible. In fact, it doesn't add to the clarity that's inherent to the text. So if you are in the camp that says, you know what, trip to Israel is not for me, I do want you to take this away from uh, tonight and from last night. Uh, you can benefit, you do benefit from your pastors and your peers going to Israel because you get to hear about all those details. Just in three minutes, we heard the impact that the Israel trip left on Smed. And of course, we're probably going to have a milestone in Smed's preaching before he went to Israel and after he went to Israel. And I think that's just going to be the case with anybody that handles God's word here from this pulpit. It's just an exciting opportunity that we had and uh, you get to benefit from that. Uh, all right, well, let's get started. I want to start kind of at a high level and just show you where we were. Here is the nation of Israel. Well, here's the land of Israel. This is where we went, the five of us. And like I said, going to the land of Israel is a really special thing. And it allows us to, to add color to the text that we already trust in. It's kind of like going to the Grand Canyon and seeing evidence of the flood that you already are convinced of. And so this is uh, just a cool opportunity to share some of the things that we saw, drum up some excitement for a future trip to Israel. But you just do need to remember that uh, the way that you'll benefit from your pastors and friends going to Israel, even if you never go there, is that you're just going to hear uh, some of those details come out in preaching and conversations when they have seen a geographic relationship and can add nuance to uh, a, a a text or a passage understanding that, that something might take three days to get to from one spot to another, or the, the wind on the Sea of Galilee, or the dryness of the desert. Um, just those details are really helpful. So here's where we were. You can kind of see on the left, we've got a map of Israel, and you see the Sea of Galilee up at the top and the Dead Sea down there at the bottom. We were busy. We went to, uh, I don't even know how many places we went to, but we had about five stops a day. And so we were on the move constantly. We kind of lived in the bus and then hit the hotel and crashed, ate dinner, um, and ate breakfast in the morning and then got up and started all over again. Yeah, so super fast pace. And it began in, uh, it began in Miami. You heard last week that the longest stay we had at any stop was actually at Miami International Airport. 
And so there's not a whole lot to share there except for just one couple of pictures of Smed while we were there. Here's one. <laughs> After a while, when you're in the airport, you just kind of feel like a man without a country. And, you know, if you're, you're in the airport and you know that airports are designed to keep you moving, right? There's nothing comfortable, no beds, there's nowhere to lay down or anything. Smed was able to work through that. And, and so we'd, he, he's a problem solver. In fact, the reason why we were delayed is because we were down a pilot. And so Smed did his best. He tried to convince the officials that he can solve that problem as well. <laughs> but eventually we did get to Israel. This is, uh, this is uh, myself, Kyle, Ben, Omri, and Tom Hanks at the Mount of Olives. We, uh, if you can see in the background, I have a hard time, okay. If you see in the background, you see the Temple Mount over there. Omri spent some time on that, so we'll just touch it briefly. Um, I do want to illustrate what I meant by you benefiting from uh, your peers' trips to Israel. If you can open up your Bibles to Isaiah 40. I'll show you what I mean. Israel is a land of rocks. It is just a land of rocks. There are rocks all over the place. Big rocks, small rocks, carved rocks, round rocks. It is just littered with rocks. One of the things that I think Isaiah probably didn't mention in Isaiah 40 when he talked about God dwelling above the center of the earth, is that he might have a cosmic salt shaker where he just put rocks all over the land of Israel. And um, I, I want you to see the impact of going to Israel just to see that and then reading the text that you already love and know. When I look at this and I, and I, and I look out the window, I'm looking at the rocks, I'm thinking of Isaiah uh, 40 verse 3. And this is eventually would be John the Baptist declaring that the Messiah had come, and it says, clear the, way for the, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low, and let the rough ground become plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. And so from the text, I already get the point. Be prepared for the way of the Lord. Be prepared, prepared for the Messiah to arrive. That's the point that, that Isaiah makes. And then when I go to Israel and I walk around, I think it was on the way out of Israel. I had said to Smed on the way into the airport when we were staying on, standing on the smooth ground, I said, you know what Israel doesn't have is a flat piece of ground. And, and I just, this, this uh, uh, passage came to mind. I thought, oh man, you know what? Not only did the original hearers and us here in Tempe, Arizona, get the point of Isaiah 40 as he begins that prophetic message. But you know what? If I, if I were in Israel, I lived in the land of rocks, not in the land of the valley with straight grid work of streets. Man, I'm looking forward to a straight path. And I, I'm looking forward to the one who's going to walk down it. And so there's just a sense of urgency that comes when you see certain things like this and you're able to connect the details that are not in the text because they're not critical to the point of the text to the things that we already know and believe. Just a couple brief things. We ate lots of food. This is what we ate. This thing right here was in uh, Bethlehem and this was a really delicious uh, meat on a stick. Not any stick, a cinnamon stick. It was really good. It was the variety that we had because everything else we had was shawarma. Chicken shawarma, beef shawarma, lamb shawarma, shawarma, shawarma. It was all shawarma. And it was really, really good. Even day five and six and seven and eight, it was really good. <laughs> really good food when you go to Israel. What made the trip was the preaching. What made the trip was the preaching. And so there, in, in one sense, you, you didn't need to be in Israel to take advantage of the very best part of the trip. And uh, Pastor Brian Farrell did most of the preaching, although we also heard from Smed and from Rick Holland. 
There was one, uh, there was one site we were at in the Jordan where we were looking at the place where Christ was most likely baptized in that area. And I just remember walking away from that thinking, I, I kind of, in the preaching, got lost as to where I was. I was actually benefiting from the preaching. And, and then after the preaching is over, I look around and can paint the backdrop of what I just heard preached. This is not in the Jordan. This is up in uh, Galilee. But the preaching is what made the trip. It was really, really wonderful. Who can bet I can get through 157 photos in 40 minutes? We'll do it. So here is, uh, back here at, in Jerusalem, we, uh, uh, we heard about Jerusalem a little bit last night, just a couple more photos. Here are the, the stones that were rolled off of the Temple Mount in 70 AD um, when uh, the, the Jews were, were trying to resist the, uh, the Romans from coming and leveling the Temple, leveling everything. They weren't successful, but they left their stones there. And so it's illustrative for us. Um, underneath the Temple Mount is something called the Hall of Ages. This is kind of hard to, to make out, but this is just something that illustrates what you see in Jerusalem, which is uh, 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 hills and valleys that are built over top of one another over and over and over. And, and you say to yourself, why, why are you walking through so many tunnels? Why are you underground so much? And that's because one civilization come through, conquer, another civilization would come through, conquer. You heard about this last night. And they'd build archways over top of the other stone archways. And so you wind up having levels and levels of generation after generation that have lived in Jerusalem. Very cool. That photo of the Temple Mount was taken from the Mount of Olives. Also near the Mount of Olives, at the base of it, you have the Garden of Gethsemane. Very sober place, these olive trees, 2,000, 2,500 years old, just huge olive trees, very sober place. We walked the streets in Jerusalem and met a ton of cool people, a ton of cool scenery. Uh, this is a really a, a, a fun place. We spent New Year's Eve in Old Town, Jerusalem. And Kyle and I, because we are... Uh, well, we're not practiced at staying out for New Year's Eve because between the two of us, I think we have nine kids. And so we went to bed promptly at 10. But cool street food, really good stuff. Um, I want to show you. The hill country we were in was gorgeous. Here is a valley. This is a, a kind of around the corner is the Ekron Valley. This is where David would have slayed Goliath. And that, that was a, um, a really neat stop because of the, uh, because of the, the preaching and, and because of uh, what Boaz, our tour director, brought out of even the Hebrew text was quite interesting. So you see all these spots. And one of the things that I saw in Israel is that, man, it is beautiful. I, I did, it, was, it was more green and lush than I ever expected it to be. Now, we went to the desert where it's as dry as a bone, and it's a wilderness. And so when you hear people come back and say, wow, there's a variety of landscape in Israel. They're right. There is just so much landscape and a variety of places that you can go to in really a couple of hours. In the hill country, we uh, stopped by some places where this is, this, I wanted to show you this. This is an underground olive press. It's 2,000 years old. This was around the corner from the David and Goliath field in Ekron. What they would do, uh, would, they would take olives and they would put them in those, in those vats and they would drop those stones, those are the original stones, and they would drop those stones, crush the olives. All of the olive oil would come out. And then they would flood the floor. They would clean the floor and they would flood it with water. Of course, what happens, the water and the oil separates. And then the oil would rise to the surface. And they would skim the oil off. And that's how uh, uh, olive oil producers would produce oil. 
And I imagine it's done in a similar, similar way in a factory now, but it has been done that way for a long, long time. And so we saw that. That was cool. Uh, an, another place that we went to that I, th- I thought was fascinating was the Herodian. Oh, that's a picture from the top of it. What was this? This was uh, what became Herod the Great's mausoleum, his grave, where, where he was buried. But before that, it was a fortress. It was a castle that he had built for himself, and he would bring um, heads of state and important dignitaries in from other countries. This is where he would entertain and whatnot. And eventually, towards the end of his life, he said that, uh, well, that's where I want to be buried. And so he had his, uh, he had his generals and, and, and people go ahead and destroy the fort that they had built years earlier and then turn it into, into a mausoleum for himself. And what he did was, if you can imagine, this hill covered in white granite. What he did is he went down to Egypt, and he sent for uh, either Egypt, I could be wrong on that, but he went, he went down to the south is what I remember, and he had white marble-colored granite brought in, crushed granite. This is ancient DG, and, and he had it cover the hill so that the hill would almost look like a snow-covered top all year round. And when I saw this and I saw all the other things, it seemed like about every three stops or about every other day, we would go to a site that Herod the Great constructed. I did not give Herod as much credit as I should have. He was called the Great for a reason. The guy was an incredible developer. And of course, he has the uh, infamy of slaughtering the babies in Bethlehem. And that's what he's known for, as, that sh- as it should be. But uh, he left his mark. And, you know, when you think about the, the, uh, uh, the threat that a new king would bring to his kingdom, uh, when you see all these places, it gives you some context to say, you know what? He had a lot to lose. He had a lot to lose. Ben continued to point that out when we got here. So this was, this was his pool. This is a swimming pool. Herod was into pools. He had a pool in every place, it seemed like. Pool up in, in the desert, even. Um, this is there at the Herodian. Ruins just everywhere. Original paint, though, on the walls still. Very, very cool. Very interesting to see stuff that old. Um, so, wh- whereas you're not going to go to a site like this and pull open a text from your Bible, it's going to give you context to say, well, why was he Herod the Great? Like, how, how big a deal was he? If he had now what he had then, he'd be a big deal. It, 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 was, it was remarkable what he built. We did go to Bethlehem, and uh, we went into a cave which would have represented where Jesus was born in a stable. Stable would have been probably something like this. And so we listened to uh, Pastor Farrell uh, preached the birth of Jesus, uh, which is really, really helpful. Bethlehem is very close to Jerusalem. In fact, there's, I took that photo in Bethlehem. That is Jerusalem, so you can get some proximity, an idea of how close those two cities are. Caves in Bethlehem. And so from there... From there, we went to the desert. So for there, from there, we went to uh, Qumran. Qumran is where we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, you know, what's just remarkable about this site, this is, this, this is the cave in which we found the great Isaiah scroll. This is what that area looks like. What's remarkable about Qumran is that what was found there just demonstrates that what we have in our Bibles is as reliable as it was when the scrolls that were found in Qumran were, were, uh, uh, what am I saying? There there was nearly zero deviance uh, between what was found written in 256 BC, I believe, 
to what we have today. This is just remarkable. Before that, there was a thousand year gap in the text, in the Hebrew text that we had had. And, and so it was really, it, it, what a wonderful discovery. Uh, when we were at MIA, we missed the tour of seeing those scrolls in the museum. Maybe next time we get to see those. But it also demonstrated a really neat way that they collected water in the desert. Um, just like in any time in Epic, the collection of water is super important. And especially when you're in the desert, water is, of course, used to live, to feed animals. And it was also used for bathing uh, and, and used for um, uh, uh, ceremonial bathing to clean uh, to become clean before you went and worship. And so what they would do is they would collect water that would come down uh, these wadis or dry washes that would have monsoons that would, uh, and, and just gush a ton of water down to the, uh, to the town and fill up these cisterns. The water would come down the hill. They would direct it. And they would fill in those cisterns full of water, and that water would last for the season that it was dry. So the, just the ingenuity was very neat to see. Also in the desert, we went to Masada. Masada was fantastic. This was a wonderful hike. We hiked three different sites in one day, including Masada. And I thought that was a lot. I came back and told some friends how many steps I took that day. And I told a wrong friend because that's kind of like what he does. He walks and talks all the time. And he, I, it wasn't impressive. But I was impressed. <laughs> um, uh, Smed got rested in the airport, and then he beat everybody up the hill. Um, it was a really cool place. Or, or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Masada was where in 70 AD, uh, again, this isn't a uh, biblical site per se, but also paints a picture of what was going on in 70 AD. I believe this is 73 AD is when Masada was taken. The Romans came and uh, sieged the, if you can see in the photo, you see the ramp there. Okay, you can see much better than I can. You can see the, you can see the, the siege ramp that the Romans built. So the, about a thousand Jews lived on the top of that mesa for three years. And finally, the Romans that were trying to get them down to get them to submit, surrender, uh, built that ramp over a three-month period. And of course, a tragic story is that the Jews on that Mesa in 73 AD all committed suicide. Uh, and even today, when the Israeli army takes an oath, it ends by saying Masada will not happen again. Uh, so just a really, really fascinating sight. There's the ramp that the Romans built, still there. And then behind it, you can see off to the right, uh, a square uh, where 10,000 Roman troops would have been. Here's a better photo of that. And so they would have all these six or eight foot pony walls around the perimeter with some walls on the inside there. And then they'd stretch their canvas, their tents over different sections. That's where they would live. And that's, that's where they lived for minimum of three months. But I'll tell you, it looked like it took about three months to build all these. There were, I want to say, five of those around Masada. Uh, and so just fascinating, fascinating history. It was quite the hike. And originally, you say, well, why would a bunch of Jews decide to go live up there? Well, in 70 AD, they, the Romans uh, leveled Jerusalem, and so this is where some of them went. Originally, it was one of Herod's, Herod's palaces in the desert. And so there is some original paint with Omri there. This was a fun visit. I got to watch one of your pastors uh, correct a Hebrew scribe. That was fun. So when we got to the top of Masada, there is a, uh, a Hebrew scribe. Can I tell this story? You already gave your... So, so that when, when we got to the top, uh, this Hebrew scribe, uh, you know, scribing text and whatnot. And for a donation, you can have your name written in Hebrew. And so we all had our wives and kids and whatnot. Uh, their names written in just on a Hebrew scratch piece of paper. And Omri had to come back and said, you spelled Obadiah wrong. <laughs> so rest assured, our pastors are faithfully in the original languages, and that is, that's an exciting thing. That was just a fun moment. Smed hiking the hill. So from uh, Qumran and the desert, there's just too many, too many sites that we went to to be able to show tonight. But 
you know, when we were in the desert, we saw the road to Jericho, Qumran, and Gedi. Um, we saw, actually, I have a photo of Engedi. So Engedi was the location where David was hiding in a cave and, and took his blade and took off a corner of Saul's robe and, of course, had the opportunity to kill him, but did not. That's where that story took place. Well, why was he there? Well, he was hiding out in the desert, right? And there was water. And there's this little oasis. So this is uh, cement up on a, on a hill where there's some water in that spot. Also in that spot are acacia trees. And, you know, I've never wondered real hard, but I wondered, what does an acacia tree look like? Um, uh, my brother-in-law this year made me something out of acacia wood for, for Christmas. He turns wood, he's a craftsman, and, and uh, he, he gives away gifts generously. And he made me something out of acacia wood this year. And I thought, that is so cool. I'm going to go uh, see what an acacia tree looks like. An acacia tree is a mesquite tree. Uh, now, I'm sure some of you know that, and you're like, yeah, I knew that. But I didn't know that. I thought that was pretty cool. So now you know that. An acacia tree is just like a mesquite tree. If I took two branches, from uh, one from mesquite here in the desert and an acacia tree, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It was, it was really neat. The bark is a little bit more smooth on an acacia tree, but now we know where that wood comes from that uh, was on, in the Ark of the Covenant and other places. Very cool. And then we went to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea was a cool place. I thought the Dead Sea was going to be a one-hit wonder. Okay, been there, done that, floated in the Dead Sea, forgot that it was January, um, so the water was a little chilly, but we had to do it, can't, can't not do it, um, and so we went to the Dead Sea, and, uh, and that was a really interesting place. Sorry, these have kind of gotten rearranged somehow. So here are your pastors and peers swimming in the Dead Sea, floating in the Dead Sea. It felt like baby oil all over your skin. It was really, really neat. It was a, it, it was the, it was a surreal feeling. And um, next time, I'm going to do what was recommended, and they pump the water from the Dead Sea up into the spa of the hotel and heat it up, and so you can actually just have the same experience in 82-degree water instead of whatever this was, chilly. Uh, we, from the oldest to youngest, exited the Dead Sea as soon as we went into it. Um, but this was just, you know, this was a fun, this was just a fun moment. Um, and, and on a trip to Israel, you get to uh, just really enjoy the camaraderie that you have among uh, believers and peers. And so this, this was a great time just to, to get to know one another even better. When you're staying with someone, for, uh, what was it, 12 or 13 days, you room with the same guy, and you get to know that guy a little bit better. In fact, I got to room with Ben James. And so after we were in the Dead Sea, one of the problems that we had was, well, we were only there for one night, and, and uh, we were going to get up early in the morning and go, but our swim trunks were all wet, really salty, almost so salty they'd stand up on their own. But we had to pack them. So what would we do? We don't know. We just hung them up. But the next morning... You know, it worked out really well because uh, I showered at night and Ben showered in the morning. And so I figured that bought me an extra 30 minutes of sleep and I heard his shower go on. That's my alarm. But this morning, not only did the shower go on, go on but somebody must have been walking through the halls with a leaf blower. And we were on like the ninth floor of this hotel you see in the middle. There's no way anybody has a leaf blower. It's coming from the bathroom. Ben's using the hairdryer. Ben's hair is half an inch long. And this is when you're sleeping, you're laying down, and you're just praying, oh, you know, maybe something will happen. I'll get another 30 minutes, miss maybe, you know, against all odds. Well, the thing went off, and I don't know, maybe I was dreaming. And then it happens again. And now I'm, now I'm really trying to figure out, why does Ben use a hair dryer? I don't, I, I can't figure, do I need to use a hair dryer? <laughs> And so he comes out of the bathroom, and I'm, I'm sitting up a little perplexed, and he goes, here's your shorts. And so they're all dry. So you get to know that your friends are kind. And <laughs> but that's, that's what we did at the, at the Dead Sea. We, we uh, floated in it. Okay, what did we do next? We went up to the Galilee region. Galilee. 
And uh, so this is about a, I mean, I mean, we went from, we went from where we just were in the desert to Galilee. I don't know, it felt like in an hour and a half. It was phenomenal. This, the Galilee region is absolutely beautiful. So we did a lot of things there. Uh, we saw, uh, we saw a, 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 one of the hotels that we stayed at, um, you guys would just have to pardon me because some of these were in order and now they're not in order, but we'll work it out. So one of the hotels that we stayed at, uh, you actually, you heard Omri talk about this last week, the, the hotel that we stayed at uh, once they started building it, or the building next door, they started building it, and they discovered a synagogue. And once they discovered a synagogue, like, okay, here we go again. This happens all the time when we're building stuff in Israel. And so they just changed the shape of the hotel, and uh, then they dig it up. But when they dug it up, they found this, this synagogue was from the time of Christ. And because of its location, there's just really no doubt Jesus taught in this synagogue. And, of course, we're looking at the ruins of it. And so uh, you don't see it in its you know, full splendor, but you can see the size of it. And it's quite small, like these JPEGs on this iPad. Here it is. Here we go. Synagogue. And so this was a really, really helpful uh, place to just see. And we saw a few synagogues that Jesus taught in, or that, that he likely would have taught in. This one seems like he almost certainly would have uh, because of its location and time period. And so when you see this, you, and, and, and we're in a building here, which you know, capacity is somewhere around 700 people, um, and, you, and, and you look at this, and, wow, I, I mean, could you fit 100 people in here? I mean, maybe cramped wall to wall. So that, that would have been the sit-down pulpit that uh, the rabbi would have uh, taught from. And so you can see even mosaics there that are still preserved. Just absolutely fascinating. From there, uh, we saw something else called an, another mountain um, that I won't spend much time on, but just a, a snapshot I really wanted to show you guys. This is a Mount Arbel from across the Sea of Galilee. This is where... Uh, Matthew 28 would have taken place. Uh, he says that he brought his disciples up to the mountain, which he designated by deduction. There's really no other mountain on the sea. Uh, there's mountains away from the sea that you can see from the sea. But this is the one that he would have uh, given the Great Commission at. We also, uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Luke 4. We're also in Nazareth, which is considered in Galilee, but it's a little bit of a drive. Luke 4 was a place I thought was really special, um, uh, in Nazareth, that is. The, um, the scene here is after Jesus would have taught in the synagogue that I just showed you, uh, near Capernaum and Magdala and by the edge of the sea. And then he would have come up, beginning in verse 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the Spirit and the news about him spread throughout all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And then when he came to Nazareth, so a little bit of a walk and uphill, where he had been brought up, this is his hometown, and was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet of Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and, the, and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of the sight of sight to the blind, 
to set free those who were oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all were fixed, of the synagogue were all fixed on him. He said, he began saying to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And so what follows is the anticipation that, that, that has built now. All of a sudden, now there's, the, the, the room is tense, and, and he reads their minds, really. He says what they're thinking, and he says, and No doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. We want to see the miracles. Do the same stuff you were doing down there. That's what we want to see. We've got sick. We've got lame. The guy that you grew up with needs healed. But he says, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. And he goes on to cite Elijah and Elisha and the famine and the leprosy that was in the land in their day. He says, just like those days when there was no belief in the land, Elijah and Elijah didn't bring those miracles that, that, those believe, that, that they wanted to see. Only a, only a couple of, um, only a couple of uh, Gentiles were healed. And there's no, um, there's no belief here either. So I likewise will do the same. And so they grabbed him by the scruff of the neck, is what Pastor Brian said, and they, they brought him down to the cliff that we were on to throw him off, but he escaped their midst. And so the, it, it, was, it was preaching that was, uh, that was so meaningful to us in these sites so we're standing here on the edge of the cliff. It's the only cliff in Nazareth. This is the one that Jesus would have been thrown off of if they could get a hold of him. But he escaped their midst. And uh, Pastor Brian brought implications from Matthew ten thirty four, where he says, you know, Jesus says, don't think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I came to bring a sword to set father against son and mother against daughter and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And it just... Was, was helpful to hear, oh, yeah, you know what? There, there is a real cost to following Christ. And, and the real cost of following Christ that you experience is not something that he is unfamiliar with. And so implications like that cause you just to remember, to say to yourself, okay, he came to bring a sword, but, but I have to remember whose hands that sword is in. And, and, and so when you're standing there in those, those places, uh, those, those texts just come alive and the implications come back with the folks who go to Israel and, and see these sites. Uh, we have a little bit of time. I would like to go to the next set of areas we went to. We went to Caesarea Philippi. Oops, this is a better one to start with. Caesarea Philippi. This is where Jesus makes a proclamation concerning the church for the first time. He, he hears Peter give a confession of who he is. Who do you say I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responds by saying, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. That is the confession that he had just made. And, and not only is this place filled with rocks, not only is Peter's name mean rock, um, when he goes on to say that not even the gates of hell will prevail over his church, he says it in a place where, um, well, it would have looked like this at the time that he was there. And these are temples uh, to pagan gods. There on the far uh, left, is, is a temple where men would be thrown in uh, alive after they were uh, found to be, you know, whatever, they, they would be destroyed by other men and, and thrown into this hole, which was in the back of, that, back of that temple. And there's a spring in that hole, and the water would come out of the spring, and eventually they'd see 
whether or not blood came out when they were thrown into that hole, and that would give them some kind of indication as to what the pagan gods thought. But Jesus was here in a place where, where in Caesarea Philippi, where there's a, a, a hole in a rock called the gates of hell. And, and so just the illustrative nature of being in a spot where Jesus says, the gates of hell will not prevail over my church. Um, it's just really, really meaningful. Very illustrative. We also went to Mount Carmel. This is Mount Carmel. This is where Elijah would have summoned fire down from heaven and um, and consumed the sacrifices after he challenged the prophets of Baal, who's a real god. And so uh, this was a really neat place. Um, today, the uh, Mount Carmel overlooks the Jezreel Valley and one of Israel's, I think, their, kind of their main Air Force base. So sometimes the sermons were interrupted by the loud jets that would go by which were kind of a welcome interruption. That was a really neat thing to see. We went to the Golan Heights. We went to some of these other places that were really fantastic. Um, You know, and it occurred to me, it occurred to me that, I hope, are are you still in, in Luke 4? Go ahead and go to Acts 1. It occurred to me on the trip It, that if, if I was on mill, that is, if, if I believed that the, the kingdom expectations that are carried through the Old Testament and into the New Testament are fulfilled in the period between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ today during the church age, then the trip would be different. The trip would be a little bit different. When, when we were together, of course, we're going to all those sites and these sites are historical sites, and they're worthy of going to, whether or not you are one of our beloved brothers who are, is on mill or pre-mill or post-mill or whatever. It, it, it's worth going to Israel to see these historical sites. It brings your Bible alive in certain ways. But on the bus and, and the group that we were with, uh, so much of our conversation had to do with future things. Not only past things, we saw past sites but then we also were having future discussion. Oh man, what will it be like for all the nations to come to Jerusalem to worship Christ on his throne physically here on the earth in the kingdom? Wow, that's going to be exciting. That's here. Look at all these ruins. That'll be different one day. Uh, you know, Acts, Acts 1 says, after Jesus... Uh, was resurrected and with his disciples and making himself known after he presented himself alive after his suffering, uh, verse 3, that's literal suffering, by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, speaking to things concerning the kingdom of God. Uh, He he had 40 days with his disciples talking about the kingdom, about the Old Testament kingdom expectation that they were familiar with, that he would come and inaugurate. And the only question at the end of his 40 days with his disciples is not the nature of the kingdom, but the timing of the kingdom. Look at verse six. So when they had come together, they were asking him saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And so the, the question is not about the nature of the kingdom, but the timing of the kingdom. Um, and go back to Luke 4 for just a second. The scripture that Jesus had read when he came into that synagogue, verse 18. The spirit of the, Lord, of the Lord is upon me because he sent me to, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
he sent me to proclaim release to the captives to, and the recovery of the sight of, to the blind and to set free those who are oppressed. That's a quote from Isaiah 61. Turn there with me. That quotation ends right there in the middle of verse 2. Isaiah 61, verse 2. In my Bible, I have a a line drawn between 2a and 2b. Jesus stops that quotation at what would happen at his first coming. That's what he was sent to do, and that's what he did. And And he stops the quotation and says, that portion of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 has been fulfilled in your hearing. But just like the literal fulfillment of those things was occurring... What follows in concerning the second coming of the Lord is also literal. To comfort the, the, and the day of vengeance of our God. That's another purpose statement for his coming. Go ahead and look at verse 3. Let's just read. To grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Glorified, the planting. Hosea says, great will be the day of Jezreel. That is, great will be the day when God plants his seed, his Messiah, in the land, in the place where he's supposed to be, in the place he literally will become and will, will establish his kingdom. And and then look what follows. Then they, those who follow the king, will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations. They will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. And so when, when you're in Israel and you're looking at one civilization after the next civilization after the next civilization of ruins... You know that one day, Isaiah 61 will be fulfilled in its completeness. You know, if if you heard out of North Africa that someone had declared that we are now Carthage again, the little country of Tunis between Algeria and Libya is where the, the great capital of Carthage was in 146 B.C., when it was uh, during the Third Punic War wiped out by the Romans. If someone today came and said, we're reestablishing the kingdom of Carthage, we'd say, okay, you're going to the loony bin. You're nuts. But, but when, when Israel m- makes an appearance on the scene again, the world expectation is there to meet it. There's, there's actually an expectation in Scripture for the kingdom of Israel to be reestablished. That's not the case with the Persians. If the Austro-Hungarian Empire came back alive again, we might be a little bit concerned. There's a, there's a crazy man in East Europe. But, but, but Israel, is, when, when it was reestablished in 1948, people got excited about it. Why didn't they say, well, these guys are Looney Tunes? Because there is an expectation for a literal fulfillment of the kingdom of Israel to be reestablished with Christ at its head. We look forward to that day. And so the entire trip to Israel is just a a great expectation that uh, we're teased with while we're there. So it's all all sorts of fun. I hope that if you guys have the opportunity to go, that, that you can come. I hope this is a new pattern. Pray for peace in that area, pray for the ability for us to go and pray for those, even if you're not able to go, to benefit from that because you will benefit along with them. Just a couple other photos before we close. Uh, The people in Israel were really wonderful. Uh, This is a a fourth generation spice trader. Uh, We brought back all kinds of spices. This was a lot of fun, uh, walking the streets and going into the bazaars and, and uh, looking for little knickknacks and whatnot. The, the funnest knickknacks were the vanilla and cinnamon and za'atar and uh, uh, cumin and stuff like that. Um, this was in uh, Caesarea by the Sea. 
Uh, you saw this photo last week. This is the top of the wall that Omri was impressed with. We all were impressed with it, left an impression on Omri, and this is the top of that aqueduct. It was, I think, seven miles or something like that. Yeah, seven miles. Uh, it's amazing what men can do. Here, here's the moat around Akko, the city of Akko. Now we have basketball courts there. It is amazing what people built with stones. It really is. And you see that all over the world, but, but Israel is a place where, if I can just go back to one photo to leave us with, Israel is a place that, uh, you know, there are uh, places in the world that you can say that is the most expensive piece of real estate in the world because it's exchangeable, because you can buy it, because you can put a price on it. There, there's that value of land in certain places, and then there's places like this where, where Abraham went and, by faith, intended to sacrifice Isaac, and, of course, the angel of the Lord stopped him from doing that, and his faith was accounted to him by, uh, as righteousness there on Mount Moriah. This is a place that we don't buy or sell. This is a place where people start wars over. Why? This is the most coveted place on earth, that hill. Because that is the hill, the one that I'm standing on in that photo, the Mount of Olives, is where Christ will return and set his feet and walk over through the east gate and set up his kingdom. We pray for that day. We look forward to it. And so go ahead and continue to pray for Israel. Pray for uh, the next group and pray that it, logistically we just come together and uh, meet our expectations. We look forward to that. And if you have interest in that, put it on your calendars. March, more details to come over the next three or four weeks. You guys, uh, I'll go ahead and pray and then you'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, thank you for an opportunity to uh, break between uh, the exposition of scripture just to look at uh, photos of your land. A uh, hundred years ago, this wouldn't, there's so many things that we just couldn't do that we're doing right now with audio and video and air travel. And, and so uh, really we have a privilege that most of the church has not had the privilege of doing, and that is to see the land with our own eyes. Lord, I pray that uh, if we do establish a pattern of traveling to the land of Jacob's promise, that that uh, every man and woman would be benefited by, uh, that would, be, would benefit from that trip and would be fruitful in what they bring back so that they are not only just a reservoir of uh, blessing that that trip would bring, but that that would be shared by everyone else. We love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.